Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Blessed Advent to all of you. During this Advent season, it is, of course, a season of preparation, a season of repentance, a season of renewed joy, of anticipation for the coming of our King, Jesus Christ. Our text this morning that we will be looking at comes to us from our gospel reading, Luke 19, verses 30 through 34. I will read it again for us. Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, you shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away, sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. This is an interesting part of this narrative. Jesus here is at the end of his ministry in the, in the gospel uh, narrative here, and he is on his way in to Jerusalem, the triumphal entry. And so the beginning of Advent, we kind of begin towards the end of the story with our gospel reading. In this section of the story, there is some prophecies that are being fulfilled. There is great shouts of rejoicing that the king has come. And what the focus oftentimes, at least in this section, is upon is in fact that donkey or that colt, hearkening back to Zechariah 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. It is obviously important thing here that Jesus is fulfilling these prophecies of the Old Testament, and that should not be forgotten. But today I want to look at this part of the story, maybe from a slightly different angle, maybe from a slightly different place, a slightly different perspective. When we look at scripture, I have a tendency, and I would imagine you have a tendency, uh, to put yourself a little bit into the story, to kind of place yourself as a part of the narrative, not to make it about you, but to really, truly look at this story and say, this is a part of my story, and so we place ourselves into the story in some way, shape, or form. And in fact, you can kind of see this as culture has played out from the beginning of Christianity till now and the artwork that is depicted, you will notice that oftentimes the artwork that is depicted is not historically accurate. And some might say, well, the, he, was a, he was a Middle Eastern and so his skin should be darker and the people should look like they were in that time, in that place. But what is going on oftentimes in the art that is depicted is people are placing themselves into the story. And so those who are hearing these words are placing themselves, people that look like them, into the story. I just got, in fact, from the Lutheran Heritage uh, Foundation, uh, their kind of holiday newsletter gift card or uh, telling us what they're doing. And they're talking about the gospel entering into Thailand. And the art that is depicted is people of that ethnic background around the manger. Mary and Joseph looking like the people of Thailand. Why? Because they are seeing themselves as a part of of the story. And oftentimes when we do that, here in this text, we're going to oftentimes place ourselves in the position of maybe the disciples, right? Your task is to go get the donkey. 
Or perhaps you envision yourselves as a part of the crowds rejoicing as Jesus comes in to Jerusalem. Perhaps you even see yourselves walking along in the footsteps of Jesus, not to make yourself Jesus, but to know that we are to walk in his footsteps wherever he would go. But today, I would like you to place yourselves not in the shoes or sandals of the disciples, not in the shoes or the sandals of Jesus, not as the crowd as he enters into Jerusalem, I want you to place yourselves as the owner of the donkey. As the one who is there, who woke up that morning going about his business. And here comes two men, two disciples who are coming into the town and they say, we need this donkey. Why? Why do, you, why do you need to just take my donkey? And a, a something of importance here is the fact that the owner is acknowledging them taking it, he is, in fact, giving it to them at the request of the Lord. They are not stealing the donkey. They are saying the Lord has need of it, and the owner graciously allows for them to take the donkey to be used. I don't know what this guy was thinking when he woke up that morning, but I imagine it wasn't that my donkey is going to be taken and used in some significant way. It is amazing to see here, as we look at this story, that all of the different pieces of the story seem to fall into place perfectly by divine by, divine, by the hand of God and his divine providence in all of these things. And a question that I want you to ponder this morning is, did Jesus need this specific donkey? The answer, of course, is no. He could have had a different donkey that had never been ridden. He could have had a different one that he could have used. And yet this man was given the opportunity to serve in this way. In a way that most people would consider to be insignificant. And yet, his response is to graciously allow the Lord to use the donkey that the Lord had given him in the first place. He is even recorded... His words are even recorded in the gospel, which is not insignificant considering that there are disciples whose words are not recorded. Joseph, the the earthly father of Jesus, speaks no words in the gospel. And yet here this man says, why do you need it? And the Lord, or and the disciples say, the Lord is in need of this, and he graciously allows them to take it. Now, we might be tempted to say, well, this is not really significant, is it? And I want to be careful not to speculate into things that the text does not say, but this man was simply faithful in what was put before him by the Lord in doing. And we are still acknowledging what he has done 2,000 years after he did it. This insignificant thing of allowing God, allowing Jesus to have the donkey that to ride into Jerusalem in his triumphal entrance. To be praised by the crowds. To be proclaimed as the true king. Now, I want you to put put yourself in his shoes. We want to be a part of Jesus' story. And I think there are times in our lives where the temptation for us is to look back and see the things that are recorded for us in the Scriptures And we look back and we say, you know what? Those are amazing things. 
I believe with my whole heart that they have happened. I believe with my whole heart that these are a reality and, and they are to be trusted. The work of Christ is to be trusted. The stories of Christ are to be believed. Yet they are something that has happened back then. And here in the Advent season, we, we look forward and we have texts of promises that Jesus is going to return. We look forward and we say, Jesus is coming back. I believe with my whole heart. I trust the words of my Savior, Jesus. But today we just have to sit and wait. We simply have to wait for the return of Jesus. And so there is a, a, a challenge that we oftentimes face is that we struggle with joyful expectation. We struggle with some of these things because we think that God has done his stuff back here. God is going to do his things moving forward. And yet God has promised that he is going to continue to be active in the world in the here and now. And so we see things as insignificant in our lives. The basic little things that we do in our lives, we see them oftentimes as insignificant. Oh, it doesn't really matter. Or how is this really that important? How is coming together as the people of God, how is that significant? How is sharing my faith with somebody in my life, how is that really significant? The temptation is to think that the things that we do in our lives have to be some type of magnificent thing for them to be of significance. This man simply woke up, was going about his day, and the Lord's disciples showed up and said, we need this. The Lord has need of this. And he graciously allowed God to do something great with a donkey. What's interesting is that this is not the only example of this in the gospel. Things that seem very insignificant become very significant. Only a little time later, as Jesus rides into Jerusalem, he is going to be celebrating the Last Supper instituting the meal that we will celebrate later on in our service today. And he goes and he finds a man who has an upper room and says, we need to use your upper room. We need to use this to celebrate the Passover, which will celebrate the first Lord's Supper. We have need of it. A very insignificant thing, right? The upper room. The guy just had a room for rent, had a, a room to be used. And here, the Lord is going to use this insignificant thing to do something miraculous. To institute the supper that the church will celebrate week after week after week. It's not only the man with the upper room, it's also Simon of Cyrene, who was coming and was going to have to just, he just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And he was chosen to carry the cross of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Pick up that piece of wood and get it to Golgotha so that we can crucify this man. He woke up, just going into the city. Right place, right time, selected by God to play a role in the story of God. Joseph of Arimathea had a grave that no one had laid in. And so he placed the body of Jesus in this grave. Again, an insignificant thing in the grand scheme of it, if you think about it. It's just a grave. And yet God is going to use all of these people to carry out his plan of salvation just in the same way that God uses each and every one of you to carry out his plan of salvation, to carry out what he is bringing about, to do the work that he, has, uh, that he is going to accomplish. Not because of your greatness, not because of your mighty strength and power, but rather because the Lord has ordained it, the Lord has claimed you, has placed you right where you are at 
for this very moment to live faithfully and do the things that the Lord has given you to do. And in doing this, each and every one of you are a part of the story of Jesus Christ. You are a part of what Jesus Christ is doing because he has put his name upon you, because he has given you the things to do, not to justify yourself, but to simply be faithful with the gifts he has given to each of you. This is something that I would pray would bring you joy. It brings significance to our lives. It brings significance to who we are. We have a role to play in what God is doing throughout the history of the world. We can take comfort that it is not our great work that gets the job done. Rather, it is God simply using simply using us and making those things that he has given us to do into something that is important. You see, it was just a regular colt until Jesus sat on it. It was just a regular room until Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper in it. It was just a regular beam of wood until Jesus was nailed to it and cried out, it is finished. It was just a grave until Jesus was laid in it and conquered death through his resurrection and took up his life for you and for me. There was nothing joyful or exciting or special about any of it until Jesus touched it. Brothers and sisters, in Christ. You have been claimed and touched through the waters of holy baptism. And because of that, nothing you do is insignificant. So let us repent of thinking that what we do is meaningless or insignificant because when we do what the Lord has given us to do, we cannot do anything greater. When the Lord has need of our lives, we simply say, yes, Lord, may you do great things with the blessings you have given to me. And it is a great joy to see God do great things. And what a blessing it is to be a part of it all by his grace, by his mercy, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as you prepare this holiday season, this Advent season, may you see yourself as a part of the story who has a role to play by the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name, amen. At this time, we'll take an opportunity to gather our gifts and offerings to the Lord.